You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. Island View with hosts Teresa O'Leary and Marshall Freeze. Welcome to Island View, a weekly current affairs show about Gabriola Island. I'm Teresa O'Leary. And I'm Marshall Freeze. And today we're going to tell you all about Gabriola TV, who we are, and what we have planned for the community. But first, Teresa is going to tell you about the fire risks here on Gabriola Island. Welcome to Gabriola TV. I'm Teresa O'Leary, and I'm here with Susan Yates, who is a trustee with Islands Trust, and we are going to have a conversation about what's been going on in terms of the extreme fire risk that's been going on in Kelowna, in Canada, and really around the world. But we're going to look at it from the point of view of Gabriola. So the last couple of weeks have been pretty brutal for all of us as we've been watching the news going on in Maui, mm -hmm. evacuations in uh, Yellowknife, mm -hmm. and then of course the devastation that's been happening in Kelowna so close to home. What's been going through your mind as you've been watching? What's been going through my mind is most of what is happening right now with the climate disaster could have been prevented by the very humans that have caused this extreme rapid change in the climate. And it breaks my heart that people have to suffer so much with the extremes of climate change. And in particularly, particular, I was thinking of residents of Yellowknife and, and maybe the First Nations people who have lived in that area for thousands of years with no discernible impact on the climate. And yet they are the ones who are suffering so, so much from, you know, colonialism, from the capitalist lifestyle that we have so heartily embraced, they suffer the impacts of, of this terrible climate disaster that other people have caused through selfishness, greed, some ignorance, although that would be very hard to claim ignorance at this point. And that breaks my heart, really. So Susan, with everything that's been happening these last few weeks, mm -hmm. a lot of people are very, very concerned about the future. Mm -hmm. As an authority with Islands Trust, mm -hmm. how, how do you deal with that? What do you say to you, the people who are coming to you and asking you for guidance? And they, they are coming to me, not necessarily for guidance. They are coming to me with extreme worry, concern, what are you doing about it? Um, they're mostly coming to me with, not, not for guidance, but concern. And what I tell them is, I did run on a mandate, very clearly stated, that I was going to support the object and the mandate of the Islands Trust, and that is to preserve and to protect the 13 main islands and the 450 satellite islands in the Trust area. And I will not waver on that. But what it usually means is I'm, there's a lofty mandate that the Islands Trust has to preserve and protect. But there are, there are so few tools in order to realize that mandate. So almost every time I have to say to someone, oh, I'm really sorry, but we actually have no tree cutting authority. Yes, someone can clear cut their entire lot and devastate that little microbiome. And yes, someone can pave, you know, 30% of their lot and not think about, well, could you just put down a surface that lets the water come through, that lets some green things grow? We have no control over any of that. We don't have subdivision authority. And I can tell you, a lot of what happens in 
The final development phases of subdivisions rests with MOTI, the Trans Ministry of Transportation, and not with the Islands Trust. We don't have control over groundwater resources. Uh, really, no one has control over groundwater resources except the people who extract. And, you know, for domestic use, most of us are pretty reasonable and we think about our neighbors as to how we try to catch water and save it when we get the winter rains. Um, but there are people who are not considerate of their neighbors. I can tell you, I'll, I'll give you an example of a concern that came up just a few days ago and this person was almost in tears telling me that their neighbor was watering their lawn and washing their vehicle weekly. Well, I just feel sick about that. How can someone be so ignorant and so careless and so selfish as to think it's okay to water a lawn and wash a vehicle when your neighbor's well is running low? So given the Island Trust governing bodies make up mm -hmm. it sounds like you are restricted in, in what you can do mm -hmm. so that's the question then what can islands trust do as we move forward right well what we can do is we are in charge of land use um, zoning zoning bylaws most of the zoning and land use is already in place so ideally what you'd want to do in a climate emergency is down zone Nobody wants to see a downzoning and a devaluing of their or devaluing money wise of their property. So, the other thing you can do is occasionally there can be crown land pieces coming up, you know, that you could put in under some sort of protection. But my first thought is what about First Nations? They should have first say over what land becomes available. They, this was their land. You know, and let's face it, if they were still living here without the effects of colonialism and capitalism, it's highly unlikely we'd, we'd be faced with this climate emergency. So there's really not very much you can do to preserve water, to preserve trees. Um, one thing I'd like to see, which is going to be taking time because if it was up to me I'd do it right now is have this entire island um, in a development permit area which would mean that every action landowners take and it doesn't prevent you from building a house or doing whatever you need to do but it means that every action landowners take would be subject to the conditions of a development permit that would protect the coastal Douglas first forest as much as possible, protect uh, water catchment areas. And we have, we are so lacking in development permit areas on Gabriola. We is, have like maybe three little wee ones. Is that because it doesn't really have a town council? No, it's is, because over the years, um, it's ne it was never seen as a priority. And um, so 30 years ago, I was a trustee. 35 years ago, I was a trustee. I don't even think we had development permit areas then. I'm sure I would have done something if we did because that would have been something that I would do. Um, we also have a development application information bylaw that is sorely out of date. That's been on our work program for, well, since I was elected because I put it on there. And, you know, that would help a lot too because that would mean that any area that is under development permit area would have pretty stringent guidelines as to how to do this and do this and do this. It doesn't stop development, it guides it in a far more climate sensitive way. But we're lacking those tools right now on Gabriola. And how do you get those tools? We have to, um, well right now the big project on, online is our official community plan update. And that's been in the works for some years, we need to do that. Those tools can be part of an OCP update. If it were totally up to me, I would put those tools first before I even did an OCP review. However, our OCP review can cover those. I just hope that it does in the end. And we do need an OCP review. It's like 25 years out of date. It's not, you know, it doesn't, it has hardly anything about climate change. It has almost nothing about First Nations, and it's lacking uh, some good wording on housing. And, you know, housing, yeah, that's a whole other issue of 
environmental concern. Absolutely. Because if everybody lived in places like me, Frank, probably Ben, probably you, we wouldn't be also in such a state of climate emergency. And I wish that we could have stronger guidelines, um, like lot coverage, for example. You don't cover half your lot with your house. You know, there's a 3,000 square foot maximum. I'd be happy with 1,000 square feet myself, which I don't even have. But let's say 3,000 square feet. There's no maximum, you know, um, square footage for building homes on Gabriola. That's nuts. So. Now, I'm new to the island, yeah. and I'm a little confused. So maybe for the sake of me and other new people to the uh, coming to the island or visitors, yeah. can you tell me what's the relationship between Islands Trust mm -hmm. and the Regional District of Nanaimo in yeah. terms of managing the right. islands and the growth mm -hmm. and the development and all of that? that? That is confusing. So generally, Islands Trust is in charge of land use um, and zoning. The Regional District is in charge of services. So, so that includes things like if we wanted a water district or if we wanted a housing authority, takes care of our garbage. Um, in some areas it would take care of, well, it takes care of recycle too with that blue box thing. But we have our own recycling depot, which I think does a far better job. That's another topic. <laughs> um, so it is confusing because regional district is services and Islands Trust is land use. We have to work together right. on a number of things, like, for example, building permits. Whenever someone takes out a building permit at the regional district office, it must comply with the land use, um, the zoning for wherever they're building. And ideally, anyone new to the island who is building would come into this office and pick up one of many handouts we have here telling people a lot of good information about water, about sewage disposal, about trees on the island, about particular ecology of Gabriola. Um, you know, but, and ideally, this is my real dream, is that all of the realtors on the island would send people here right away. Go to the Islands Trust office, pick up the necessary information before you even think about what you're going to build on your lot. Okay, bringing us back to where we are right now in this really extreme fire risk. Mm -hmm. A lot of Gabrielans are feeling very vulnerable right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that in 2019, Islands Trust did declare a climate change emergency. They did. So can you tell us what's been done since 2019 as a result of that declaration, mm -hmm. uh, what steps have been taken to deal with all of the various issues around that, and what's the plan going forward? Well, I was actually at that council meeting in March of 2019 where the Islands Trust made two really important declarations, one on reconciliation and one on climate, the climate emergency. And I actually remember the presentation that a former trustee from Salt Spring, Peter Lamb, did um, that kind of instigated the um, climate emergency declaration on, at that council meeting. So since that time, um, in a way, it was a very important declaration because it is considered at every step of, well, what shall we say, deliberations that council makes and also local trust committees make. So, for example, when we're redoing the Islands Trust policy statement, which is kind of in a stalled period right now for various reasons, um, that climate emergency declaration will be right up front and center. When we work on our official community plan on Gabriola, that climate emergency declaration will be right up front and center. Um, let's see what else. Uh, anything the, that the Islands Trust Conservancy works on, and I am a board member on the Conservancy, which I feel so fortunate to have been elected to that board as well. Always that climate emergency declaration will be considered. Although I have to say, um, with things like the Islands Trust Conservancy, even without that declaration, we would be always looking at climate change. Of course. Which are the properties that we may be able to save? You know, Which are the areas in the trust area that are the most important ecological niches 
or that provide maybe a flyway for migrating birds or a little migration place for salamanders, things like that. Mm -hmm. The Conservancy would certainly be looking at the climate emergency with or without a declaration. But it is nice to have that solid declaration in place to say, we recognize this. As, you know, as feeble as our tools may be, the philosophy that we carry with us is strong. Okay. So, you know, I'm very well versed in how to handle an earthquake. Yes. Because there were a lot of public education campaigns mm -hmm. going on over the years to ensure mm -hmm. that the public knew what to do, mm -hmm. right? We all have our kits. Where is the equivalent in this time right. with the fire or risk? the fire risk. Why aren't authorities stepping up mm. and upping the game? Well, you know, I, I think our local fire department actually does provide quite good information. So I think they sort of, you know, and, um, and our local and provincial emergency service um, that works out of, I can't remember, it works out of, the People for a Healthy Community are separate. Anyway, okay. they certainly provide guidelines similar to earthquake emergency. Have this stuff ready in case of fire, you know. But as far as evacuation, actually, I that would be a really good thing to interview the fire chief about because I, some months ago, maybe a year ago, they did a really good evacuation exercise from the whalebone area using the Gertie bus. Um, to get because there's only one way in and one way out of whalebone unless you're going to leave by by a boat. So, the islands trust as far as what we can offer. Well, I would love to say to people, stop cutting all the trees. <laughs> that is the best insurance against climate change. Is leaving forests, even leaving copses of trees. And why can't you, as an authority, make that happen in cities? I know. There are all kinds of rules about what you do on your land with your trees. Yeah. So we, why is it here asked. you don't have the, the well, okay. authority? Well, okay, I'm going to be really blunt here. Okay. We were ready to ask, ready to ask, ready to ask, as a council, go to the province and say to the Ministry of Forests, give us this power to limit tree cutting, uh, especially in the, you know, with considering our mandate, right? Exactly. And especially considering that when you move here, you should be aware that you're moving to a somewhat protected area. Well, we were just about ready to go to the province with that request, and then there was like, um, what would you call this? A, a, contra, a, a contra movement of sorts that came from council members on other islands to not ask for that. I see. To not ask for that. And then it was almost like, kind of like a little mini bad wildflower going around council. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they're right. Oh yeah, he's right. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we can't ask for that. It's like, oh, are you kidding? You know, <laughs> we worked so hard for this. You know, so some of us were just in despair. It got, it got voted. Like, they voted not to do it. Yeah, it must have been disappointing for you. I was shocked. Mm -hmm. Um... I mean, there is a lot more that we need to ask the province for to support the Islands Trust. Our budget is dismal from the province, considering that we have a provincial mandate to do this work, mm -hmm. and we get less than 2% of our budget from the province. The rest has to be raised through taxpayers, you know, many of which don't really care about the mandate of the Islands Trust. But so these islands are supposed to be protected and preserved for the whole province to enjoy. So tell me more about the origins of the Island Trust. I know it was, you know, 19, it's 50 years ago next June, yes, right? Yes, yes. So, you know, I think a lot of people at this stage have forgotten why these islands are protected. I've even forgotten. So I've remind almost forgotten us. and I've lived here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so remind us, what is so special yeah. about these islands that we have to protect them? Well, they're an archipelago in the Salish Sea between three large urban areas, Victoria, Vancouver, and Nanaimo. They're a really popular place to come and visit, and I still have no problem with that. Please come and visit. Please be so careful about how you come and visit. Um, but those of us who live here, I, I mean, I take this really seriously. Those of us who live here really need to be good stewards 
you know, just not just because we live here, but because we're supposed to be caring for these islands for everybody in the province. And I sometimes think, uh, I, I wish when the Islands Trust had been formed that there had been more thought and care and time put into doing it. I know it was, it was because of a, an immediate reaction to rampant development on Pender and Gabriola actually, two developments, Magic Lakes and something called Wildwood, not Wildwood, Wildwood, on Gabriola caused the province to say, oh, we got to put a 10 acre freeze on these islands and then figure out what to do with them. Right. So after the 10 acre freeze, they said, okay, we'll you know, put, put the control of land use zoning and bylaws into this special, this special agency, mm -hmm. which was good. Um, but the agency never got the tools it needed to complete the job and to do the job well. So, I mean, I was in, at the post office a few hours ago and someone beside me was asking me about, well, what about this? And I said, I'm sorry, I can't do anything except tell you to, to do your best job. Right, you know? right. You know, it sounds like it's a frustrating role to play when you don't have the tools and you've got an environmental crisis on your hands. Well, isn't that interesting? Because I did this job three other terms. And Frank will remember, I did the job in the 80s and the 90s. And um, it was less frustrating then for two reasons. There were not the pressures to develop as there are now. There, our provincial budget was um, like almost 50% of our budget was provincially funded. So we felt like we could hire planners and do more planning, do more protection work. And I guess the other thing was, uh, well, there wasn't the climate emergency in the 80s and the 90s. So what I see now as a trustee with lots of experience and you know, I'm, I'm pretty broad-minded. Some, some of the most wonderful things on Gabriola have happened because of people who have moved here in the last 10 years. But also some of the most terrible things have happened because of people who've not just moved here, they've been here some time, but maybe they've just moved here, and they don't come to be in community and they don't come to learn how to live here as a steward and as a good member of the community. They, they come to take. Mm. They come to extract and take. They don't come to be part of community and give. And that is so painful. And you don't feel like there's really anything that could be done to, you know, to, st to educate those people, inform those people, and then perhaps change their thinking? I, I never give up. I live with critical hope all the time. <laughs> you know, hope directed at getting stuff done, not just willy-nilly hope and hope that the you know climate will fix itself. I always live in hope that, for example, I, I volunteer with the Nature Stewards with Gabriola Lands and Trails Trust, and what a great group they are. And every once in a while you visit a property with a new landowner and this new landowner is like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I can do that. It's like, oh, I love this. Yes, you are such a wonderful person to have on this island that will help, you know, make this community stronger, maybe, maybe a little greener. Um, I never give up hope that people will be educated to, to just try harder. But, but I what, I, what I do sometimes despair at is at how little people of my generation and older, how little they will give up of their privileged lifestyle so that the next generation can just survive. I am shocked at how greedy and selfish people of my generation are. Of some, not, not all. I have lots of people working with me tirelessly on environmental issues, but that is what makes me feel despair, is you won't even give up that trip to Costco in your giant SUV to stock up on crap that comes over on freighters so that the next generation will have a place to live. That's what makes me angry and sad. And do you feel a little powerless at the Yes, I feel moment? powerless because you can't change people's attitude by railing at them and being angry at them. Right, exactly. And so that actually leads me to my question about 
I came over on the ferry. Yeah. I'm a newbie. Yeah. Now, I've been on the island, so I know about how you have to be conserving water and be careful with fire and all that. Mm -hmm. But lots of people who come over on that ferry are coming for a vacation. They're mm -hmm. from the city. They don't know anything about rural life. Mm -hmm. But I find people here on Gabriola expect anybody that comes here to know things. And I, mm -hmm. so I feel I, I am seeing this disconnect between the desire for everybody to be informed, mm -hmm. the need for people to be informed, but there's no informing going on. And that will only come from an authority like Islands Trust or RDN or the provincial government, like with the provincial campaigns around earthquakes. That yes. raised everybody's awareness yes. around that. So I, I'm going to put that back to you mm -hmm. again. Why is Isla Trust not taking steps in that direction? On the ferry, for instance, mm -hmm. why isn't the BC ferry captain, an authority, yeah. talking to the passengers, locals and visitors, mm -hmm. saying, we're in an extreme fire risk right now, be mm -hmm. extra careful, you can't do this, or you know, whatever the message is. You know, is. they have done that before. Right, I've heard that. I've been on the ferry in past years where the captain has said something about the extreme fire risk right. and wildlife on the roads. So why isn't that happening right now? I mean, if it's such an extreme situation, yeah. where are the authorities hmm. in stepping up the campaign to actually inform residents about things? I mean, I don't think we can just sit back and expect everybody to watch the news. Mm -hmm. Lots of people are not watching news today, so how do we get right. to everybody, well, right? I know there's big signs on the Nanaimo side in, in the terminal waiting area about you know wildlife and fire risks, and, and I, I see those signs, but I'm kind of looking for them too. Um, but on this side, on when this you come side, off the ferry, there's off, nothing. Well, interestingly, only a little sign by an Arbutus tree. Yeah, little tiny white sign, no fires. I know. Then you go up yeah. the road to the village. There's a big sign there. That's great. Stream. But yeah. why isn't there a ferry captain talking about it? Brochures on the right. thing, big signs on the ferry. I don't well, know. Well, <laughs> you know that's interesting. I am on the ferry advisory committee. Um, hey, there's a great idea that I can bring up because I think actually BC ferries is, is they have been very cooperative and very helpful in right. the past. Sometimes, you know, we're so frustrated with BC Ferries, but having seen the behind the scenes of how they operate, they have, they're overcoming some huge hurdles and they're actually doing a good job on many fronts. But that is something that we can bring up to the Ferry Advisory Committee and um, we get usually a pretty good response from them. Well, that would be awesome because I've yeah. heard so many people complaining. They, and then also mm. the cigarette butts. Oh, well. I mean, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what's being done to target that particular group? For instance, but I was at the Gertie can bus you stop. Teach, can you teach anyone about cigarette butts? So, I mean, would anyone well, dropping can't. a butt on the <laughs> dry ground actually listen to you? I bet you they would. I bet you if there was an ashtray there, they would put it in the ashtray. But at the Gertie bus stop, for instance, I was yeah. there yesterday. Yeah. Butts everywhere. And everybody's complaining. And I'm like, well, where's the ashtray? I mean, you know. Mm. Uh, there could be permanent ashtrays put there for smokers. And who so what are them? smokers supposed to do? I don't know. Yeah. The authorities have to figure these things out. I'm not okay. an authority. I'm asking okay. the questions. I'm writing that down too. I need right. to borrow your pen. <laughs> okay, go oh, for because, it. Um, but it's just that... That's what I, I mean, I'm on the Gertie... I mean, this is ridiculous. I'm also on the Gertie board. That's um, awesome. She's on everything. <laughs> but, but that would more likely be the responsibility of someone maybe like Rick Mitchell who looks after the village right. property and he would be quite sympathetic to that. So what I'm hearing and what you're saying is that the silos of government are still in place. So BC Ferries is over here, Islands Trust is here, RDN is here, the local people are here, and there's not a lot of communication about, you know, collaborating to make the message clear to all citizens, you know, that we have to be super, super careful right now. But I, I wouldn't I, have known that if people didn't tell me. So I would really appreciate that. Like you said, there are local people who are really great. Right. But again, I don't think relying on individuals to take care of these matters is appropriate. I think it's a government responsibility. And so that's why I've asked you well, to ask these questions. I will. All right. And, I will, and if it's doable, it'll be done. Okay. Because that's how I operate. I like that. Um, and we'll check back in with you later and see how things are going. That's right. But you know, the other thing is we have a visitor's information center. And I can say with quite delight that... Uh, the people working there, most of them are children that I've known since they were born on Gabriel, so they know the scoop. Yes. And I think people who check in there are given some pretty good directions and information about you know what to do on Gabriel, for sure, how to visit this place, and not 
not endanger it. But not everybody goes to the tourists. Oh, I know. Right? Yeah, it's just, that's a lot just of people come by their boats. Yeah. They come on yeah. the ferry, you know. So anyway, yeah. just raising that as a yeah. question because as a newcomer here, right. I've just been hearing and listening to, you know, the various concerns. Right. And uh, those two are big ones. And, and I keep feeling like those are solvable in yeah. the sense of, you know, it's all about communication in a disaster yeah. or in a crisis. Yeah. So where's the communication, I guess? And so yeah. I'll just leave that with mm -hmm. you. Do you have any final thoughts on, on you the know, climate what, emergency or just generally like about what you wanted to say to our audience mm -hmm. as a trustee from Islands Trust? who is, you know, responsible for some of these things. Mm -hmm. It's a big responsibility. It's a yes. difficult time. I'll say one thing. I am so fortunate to have two, two other local trustees who are on the local trust committee with me, representing the Gabriela Trust area, Peter Luckham and Toby Elliott, who I think are just as uh, concerned and just as dedicated to doing a good job, as good a job as they can. And so working with them feels really good mm -hmm. because I could be working with other trustees who are not elected to support the trust, who are elected in fact to get rid of the trust, to represent private interests. This happens, as it happens anywhere in any government. You'll have counselors in a city who are there to help their friends develop inappropriately, right? I feel so lucky that my local trust committee is as, uh, as thoughtful as I am about where are we going? How can we get to a better place? How can we make, not make, how can we somehow get people to just do with less, just give up just a little bit so that there will be enough for the next generations, for the ecology of this place, for the foreshore, for the marine environment, yeah, if I can, without lecturing, if I can just get that message out. Come to Gabriola, have a wonderful time, be part of this community. If you're just a visitor, um, please appreciate this, this beautiful natural environment and, and don't endanger it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. You're so welcome, Teresa. And um, you live here now, right? I do. <laughs> I'm a resident. I am very happy to hear that. And <laughs> me uh, too. <laughs> you've heard it from me. Be part of this community. I know you will because I remember hearing you on CBC Radio. I know you understand some the really important things that affect our environment. Well, thank you. It was really nice to meet you. And we'll have more conversations like this in the oh, future. Oh, yes, we do. And anytime you want to direct it at another specific issue, feel free. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. That was Susan Yates, a trustee with Islands Trust. She's one of three Island Trust trustees. You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. Welcome to Gabriola TV. I'm Teresa O'Leary, and I'm here with Will Sprogas, the fire chief for Gabriola Island. Welcome, Will. Thank you. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having us. So we are in a, a severe situation this summer in terms of wildfires with what's happened in Kelowna, Lahaina down in Maui, evacuations from Yellowknife and more in the news. What's been going through your mind the last couple of weeks as all that's been happening? Um, just making sure that the membership's prepared and making sure that we kind of have an idea of what, what the plan is and make sure that the public are aware of our evacuation study that was done in, in 2022. And uh, yeah, just making sure that that's in the media and that people are recognizing that, know which zone they're in, and that they're signed up for a buoyant alert system with the RDN so they, they do get the early call to evacuate. Okay, and tell me about that plan, that emergency plan. Yeah, so it was a study done by the RDN. Um, they looked at uh, removing people from Gabriola using Gabriola Ferry. So with the two ferries in service, um, the, the plan is good in the sense that they'll use the Gabriola Ferry to remove people. They also did the study with other agencies such as Coast Guard, RCM SARS, and, uh, and other vessels that are available for the island. We did practice last August. We practiced evacuating 
uh, the whalebone area out and we used the road to the ferry as well. We used the hovercrafts from the uh, Vancouver airport and we used one hovercraft to transport people from um, Sandwell Beach to uh, Pilot Bay on Cape Rilla. And after that exercise, how were you feeling about your, your readiness? Uh, we were feeling quite good because we hear that the hovercraft can make good time to Gabriel if they're not facing a headwind. They could be here in about 20 minutes. Um, and the nice thing about the hovercraft is it can be right up on the beach so we can get people and we can get mobility challenge people on the vessel if we have to. Okay. So I'm new to the island. I don't know anything about escaping a fire. I do know about earthquakes because there's been a lot of public education around that. Uh, you know, we all have our emergency kits for the earthquake, but I haven't seen anything similar in terms of fire risk, and it's been such a severe summer. Uh, do you think there's enough being done to in inform people like me who's I'm new to the island? I don't know anything. Yeah, yeah, I think we're, well, we're doing our best. We are a volunteer organization. Um, I'm the only paid staff, myself and the administrative assistant um, are the only paid staff here. So we feel we're doing a good job in that sense. Um, we have an active Fire Smart program. Uh, we have a Fire Smart coordinator that gets around and does talks. As well, we host open houses and we have a website, gabriellafire.ca. You can find our links to Fire Smart and other materials there that are needed. Um, as well, we, do, we try to do an open house in the spring um, to bring awareness to the oncoming wildfire season and uh, really just getting those community members together in uh, grassroots groups to start fire smarting their neighborhoods. Um, that's going to make the, the difference and, and uh, we're seeing that difference. We do have crews on some of the fires across BC right now and uh, they can tell by properties that have been fire smart versus properties that haven't been fire smart and fire fire does uh, it does improve the situation and fires will move around structures like that. Can you tell me a little bit more about that what they're seeing in that difference? Uh, so what they're seeing is they're seeing basically it's just uh, well organized properties that uh, remove fuel load from those properties. They've also prepared the house with materials on the roof and on the walls to keep the fire um, from entering into the premises as well keeping it away keeping vegetation away from the house like trees um, and then keeping your furniture like your lawn furniture putting that away or having the ability to cache it somewhere away from the house um, what our crews are supporting with is sprinkler operations so they'll go in and they'll protect that structure with sprinklers um, so our crews have a water truck out on, on the fires right now that are help supplying water and potentially going back to those houses and putting out spot fires. So yeah, just basically we want people to prepare their house and uh, a winter storm and seeing where the snow falls is a good example of where the ember cast is going to end up on your house. So if you've got decks um, with, with combustible material on the decks or, or uh, furniture there that's likely spots that might collect embers and then catch fire. So to learn more about it though please go to our website and look at um, FireSmart and Gabriella's FireSmart program. Do you think that local people here on the island are taking it seriously and doing those things? Yeah we have quite a few neighborhoods. Um, there's a NEPS program that's run by the RDN uh, Shirley Nicholson that gets around and puts these groups together. So they're prepared not just for wildfire, but for any emergency that are gonna hit. Um, and that's what it's gonna take. And, and it prov proved itself uh, with the power outage that we saw and communications outages that we've seen in the past. Those neighborhoods work together. Um, they start a resource list of what resources they have in their neighborhood. And yeah, everyone works as a team to keep everyone safe. So we really want to promote that and make sure that everyone's aware of the, the NEPS program. Right. And if they have questions about it, please call the fire hall and we're happy to direct them to that program. You mentioned earlier to me something about the 911 had been down for a while and you guys have taken some steps to rectify that situation? Yeah, so we've been working on that. We've had two communications outages, um, one this last winter. 
uh, where we saw 911 down for uh, six days uh, and the fire hall was actually turned into a dispatch sensor center while that that emergency was going on. Um, he, some people could still make calls, local calls into the fire department, but outgoing calls off the island couldn't go out. And cell phone was down because the only connection to the island was through the landline to the cell tower. So crews were here and able to radio out to our dispatch to get our members paged out to emergency calls, as well as the ambulance and RCMP. So we were acting as that, that go-between. Um, I've been actively working on getting interagency to work together. We've got a common radio frequency now um, that's based off a repeater off Mount Benson. Um, so communications in that situation where cell tower or landline's going down, we can use our radios to communicate around the island. Um, so yeah, we're just in the process of getting everyone on board with those, with those radios and they're getting the program. Great. So since I just arrived here about a month ago and I've been hearing a lot of the local talk, I guess, and I must say I feel I, I've been hearing a lot of fear in local people, uh, particularly about the visitors coming to the island. Um, there's uh, a lot of fear around people coming here and not knowing the fire risk or not understanding how severe it is. And I just wondered what are your thoughts around that? Um, I think st locals as being stewards of the island uh, and play a very important role. They need to go out and help educate um, our guests to the island to make sure that everyone's up on it. And just friendly reminders of fire safety and that Gabriola isn't like other communities that has large fire departments with mutual aid. Um, and just a friendly reminder that, yeah, we're a small knit community. Uh, we rely on our volunteers to respond to fire calls and uh, medical calls. So we just, yeah, ask them to help respect our area. Right. Keep it safe. Do you think there should be more done on that? I tell you, as a person who's come to the island, I was shocked that on the ferry, there were no signs, no brochures, no message from the captain telling me about the severe extreme fire risk that we're in. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered, is that, so I, in the past I've heard that that was done in other situations, so I'm just curious if you think BC Ferries should be doing something to cooperate with the fire department to make sure that people are informed coming to the island. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, we have in the past had the uh, BC Ferries communicate that message. Um, I'll double check in with them. It's a little harder now that we have two vessels. We used to have a very local crew that knew um, the message and would get the message out. We now have one ferry that's based out of Nanaimo. So yeah, I'll, I'll check in and see if that messaging can be provided. Right. Um, but then again, just yeah, always go to our website and people are urged to call the fire hall if they have any questions. Sure, but a lot of people come over for a weekend or they come on their boats from Silva Bay and you know, they're city people and not all people know about the vulnerability of the islands, right? So yeah. uh, I actually talked to Susan Yates at the Islands Trust about it. So she actually is working on that as well, because from my perspective, I would have loved it if somebody had really raised my awareness right away. Mm -hmm. Luckily, when I came on the island, my friends did that. Yeah. Um, but uh, so that's just one thing I was just wondering about. Now, what else can be done to ensure that we protect our, I mean, we're vulnerable on an island, right? So how, how, what else can be done, or is there more that should be done, in your opinion, given the extreme nature of where we're at right now? Yeah, this is some of the teachings that the RDN are going to push and the NEPS program is your grab-and-go bags, have all your documents and stuff ready to go. Um, yeah, be prepared to be 72 hours on your own. Um, yeah, make sure you have enough food and water for that. And that's any emergency, not just wildfire. Um, so it's really, really getting getting together and making sure that neighborhoods are organized. Okay. Any final thoughts? Um, any message you want to give yeah, out? Yeah, always the message that uh, we are a volunteer organization. We are paid on, paid on call, fire department. Um, and we're looking to recruit people. Um, right now we're doing a recruitment drive. We're looking for 
six members and uh, yeah people can apply uh, we've got a link on our website and there's a recruitment link please go to the re recruitment link and click on um, the application form if you're interested we do a lot of uh, very interesting stuff we obviously fire is our first priority fire fire safety um, we do rescue we do medical medical is the bulk of our calls about 70 percent so we're training people up to emr level which is emergency medical responder uh, it's the base level that the paramedics have um, so it gives us a lot of capability to help treat our, our um, residents of Gabriola. Right. Yeah. Are you worried about being able to recruit firefighters at a time when, you know, some we've had a couple of deaths this summer with the firefighters uh, fighting the wildfires, right? Um, yeah, I think, I think from the recruitment standpoint, um, we're such a close-knit group um, that support each other. Um, a lot of people call it the fire family. So once they do come out to a practice, they realize that uh, it is like a, a very close group. They get together and they feel quite safe. They can put their trust in each other. Why do you do this? I mean, this is very dangerous work. If, if you did have to go into any fire, especially a wildfire, mm -hmm. uh, what drives you to do this? Um, it drives me to do this because I grew up in this community. Um, I'm raising a family in this community. Uh, my parents live in this community, so we just want to keep everyone safe. And uh, yeah, that, that's what drives me to wake up and do this every day is just uh, knowing that I'm protecting the people that we care about. Okay, thanks so much, Will. Thank you. That was Will Sprogus, Fire Chief for Gabriola Island. So Teresa, I understand some action has been taken since we conducted these interviews. Yes, I am happy to report that BC Ferries on the Gabriola Ferries will now be announcing a warning about the extreme fire risk on the island to passengers coming for a visit as well as locals just to remind everybody. I raised the issue in an interview with Susan Yates, the Island Trust trustee, as well as the fire chief Will Sprogus, and they both agreed that it was a good idea. Susan reached out to the chair of the Ferry Advisory Committee here on Gabriola, Stephen Earle, and he reached out to Victoria immediately. And so within a week, that action has been taken. You are watching Life on Gabriola TV, community television, for you, by you. Gabriola TV is a local media outlet. We recently launched our journalism initiative and put out the call to volunteers to help us with our programming. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for coming out to our Life on Gabriola Media Society launch. Uh, I think I mentioned not for profit, by the people, for the people. Uh, I'm super proud to be a part of something like this um, because I love this community and I think there's a lot going on in this part of the world that uh, is newsworthy and is important and isn't being talked about and I know we all care deeply about a number of different uh, issues and obstacles facing the Gulf Islands and uh, all the things. So it's a very exciting time, it's a very exciting time for the society and for Gabriola and uh, with that, I think I'd like to pass it over to the, our board president, uh, Mr. Frank Moore. There you go, sir. Okay, thank you, Ben. Ben is, uh, did he say he's one of our board members? Um, and the hiring committee and the treasurer. That's correct. All those things. Uh, and you'll meet uh, other of our board members later uh, in this presentation. Uh, some of them were able to be here. Uh, we really appreciate that, and we really appreciate the board members for supporting this brand new initiative. You know, to start something brand new uh, is fun, but uh, it's a lot of work. And the board members have been really stepping up to help out, uh, not just with board member stuff, but all sorts of things besides. As you can see, uh, Ben is doing and other people have done for today. Thank you for being here. This is a launch event, and a volunteer sign-up 
for the new Life on Gabriola TV, which uh, has been created by the Life on Gabriola Media Society. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the origins of the project, why uh, it exists. Uh, uh, but uh, first, I want to advise you that we are really happy to have you here today as well, uh, because we need volunteers. The whole concept behind this is that it is community driven. We are very lucky to have some very skilled professional journalists uh, sort of uh, leading the way and providing training, among other things. But this must be community driven. I'll tell you more about that. So we appreciate your being here today. And over there is a table where you can uh, find information and a form, which I will be happy to take from you after this, uh, to volunteer. And I and Teresa, our lead journalist, will be happy to answer your questions uh, after or even during this uh, event uh, and uh, tell you everything hopefully you need to know in order to decide how you might like to help with this new venture, Life on Gabriola TV. A new, uh, I would suggest very radically new, journalism initiative on Gabriola. So how did this happen? Well, uh, this is funded by uh, something called the Local Journalism Initiative, which was created around 2019. Uh, it is an initiative funded by the federal government, administered by various uh, intermediary organizations, uh, and it is intended to, well, you know what? It's intended to save journalism. Because journalism is having problems these days. Uh, so some people had the foresight to see this coming. And in particular, local journalism, journalism at our level, is in jeopardy. Local papers, and mostly their papers, newspapers, are dropping left and right. So the Local Journalism Initiative is an initiative to uh, support journalism of various kinds in what the uh, organization, Cactus, I'll tell you more about them, calls news deserts. That's a little drastic, perhaps. It is a bit dry here right now. But I don't know where that kind of desert. But what they mean is communities who are Maybe they've always been underserved, or they have become underserved by uh, news media. It is also, so, uh, so the local journalism initiative was, was started and funded uh, in order to address that growing problem. Uh, and it is administered by various uh, uh, NGOs uh, for the newspaper sector. So, for example, I believe the sounder here... Um, on Gabriola uh, is receiving local journalism initiative funding to uh, to employ my former student from VIU, Rochelle Stein Watton, as a journalist uh, for print media. There, er, there is an organization which is in supervising uh, local journalism initiative funding for radio stations, community radio stations, uh, and now, or there has been, and now we are part of it, an initiative to support community. TV. Now let me say by TV we mean anything on a screen. Anything on any screen. It might be on your TV because some of the programming we do will appear on uh, Shaw Cable. Uh, and as you know, you can take your phone and if you know how to do it, you can cast you know, YouTube and anything else you wish onto your TV from your phone or anything else. Or you can just watch it on your computer. Or you can just watch it on your phone. So when we say TV, we mean anything on a screen of any kind. Uh, and that's what we're going to be producing programming for. So we are covered by, so I don't have my notes, and I'm not going to go get them. But it is an organization which has for years, a very long time, going back to the very earliest days of cable TV, community cable TV, advocated for uh, community journalism at a very local level. Uh, their acronym is CACTUS. Uh, and they are the people who uh, are administering the funding for this project. Uh, these projects are happening. This is the first time it's happening on Gabriola. But they're happening all across Canada. They're happening 
in both official languages, and there's a great energy for programming in numerous languages. Uh, in uh, what we call Canada. So it is an initiative that has been around a long time and we have finally been able to take advantage of it here on Gabriola. We formed, in order to receive the funding, we had to form a society. And we only did that about six weeks ago. <laughs> so we also need your money. But in order to receive the funding, the funding is for uh, professional journalists and videographers and some equipment to get them started. And those uh, journalists, our lead journalist, Teresa, you're going to be meeting momentarily. But the early uh, success of this project has been we have been able to bring Teresa to Gabriola, and we have also been able to find on Gabriola a very skilled videographer, digital content creator, uh, Marshall Fries. Marshall uh, couldn't be here today. He's off island today. But uh, he is a person who moved here about six months ago. His family ha has lived here a long time. Um, and we were able to say, hey, how'd you like a job doing that stuff? So the uh, funding from uh, Cactus covers the fees for the professional journalists and videographers. And it also covers some equipment costs. Everything else we're going to have to fundraise somehow. But what we are most interested in today is volunteers, people who wish to create programming, not just watch it. The whole idea is, is for us to, to, you know, not be passive consumers of content. I used to say to my students in journalism classes and other classes at VIU, you know, you're here so you can become a creator of content, not just uh, a person sitting on the couch consuming it. And that is the very strong basis for the Local Journalism Initiative too. We together create, in this case, journalism, in this case, video journalism, about our community, Gabriola. And while we have very skilled people to help guide us, uh, it is actually a condition of the grant that 50%, at least 50% of the programming must originate with you. We, <laughs> thank you for asking. <laughs> Teresa will tell you. <laughs> so that is, the, that is the basis for the program. That is the basis for the funding. Uh, and we are delighted that we have been able to secure this for Gabriola. Now, I want to give props to Ken Zakretsky, who, even though he lives in the Netherlands, uh, is the administrator of the Life on Gabriola Community Bulletin Board. Ken, as some of you will know, was uh, uh, crucial, fundamental to an effort to create a community radio station on Gabriola uh, a number of years ago, which foundered for want of a tower. But he has kept an eye on things, and he has kept an eye on Gabriola. And he's the guy who spotted this opportunity uh, and applied for it. And when it came through, because I helped him like with the application a bit, I was gobsmacked. I had said to him, Ken, wh what? We're not TV. What do you mean? But it turns out the people administering the funding are more inventive thinkers than I am. So now we are creating TV for Gabriola, and I want to give props to Ken Zakretsky for spotting the opportunity, which some of us have now taken up the torch to carry forward. So that is the basis for this project, and that's the reason for this event this afternoon, to, to hopefully get you to volunteer. If you pick up the little handout over there, you will see the kinds of uh, help we need, and there's all kinds of help. And there is training available too. It is also part of our mandate to train. Some of us can train you in a journalism standards, the basics, the fundamentals of good journalism. Some of us can train you how to handle a camera and edit video. So there's various people around that will help and will be producing programming themselves. 
But we need you to bring forward your ideas for shows, for series, to pitch, hey, why don't you cover this, why don't you cover that, and also to say, and I'll help you do it, if you'll help me help you do it. That is what Life on Gabriela TV is here for, starting right now, because our programming is going to be appearing in about uh, five days, I would guess. In fact, Jesse, one of our board persons, where's Jesse? Here she is. Jesse uh, is one of our uh, board members. She is here filming this today. That's why we're down here off the stage, uh, so we have enough light to do so. Um, and uh, that will be appearing on uh, line soon. So the programming will appear online in all sorts of ways. It will appear on the Life on Gabriella Facebook community bulletin board, the largest on the island, 7,800 members. Uh, we're, 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 we're addressing that. It will, however, also address, uh, we, it will also appear on all the other boards. It will also appear uh, on YouTube. And it will also appear on the National Community Media Portal, which is maintained by Cactus, where all the programming being created by dozens of communities, typically small communities, across the country appears. You can go, you'll be able to go there and uh, watch the programming for those other communities as well. And we also have a print component, which will be a quarterly digest of, of what we've posted and what's upcoming that will also be available uh, in the community as well. So, uh, and eventually the programming will appear on cable TV too. So there will be myriad ways to uh, uh, watch it. And that's why we need myriad of you coming to create it. And I will be at that table and I will be glad to talk to you about how we can work together to do that. Having said that, I would like to now introduce to you uh, our lead journalist, a person we are very, very fortunate not only to have hired, but to have had move here to Gabriola as a result. <laughs> Teresa O'Leary. And when Jesse gives us the go ahead, then I will talk to you. But in the meantime, I will just say that I've only been here for two months, and I love it. <laughs> and I am very delighted that I have found a place to live here on the island to do this work. We were talking about me working remotely, because I might not have been able to find a place here. But, you know, the gods came and helped me out, so here we are. <laughs> Good to go? Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm so delighted to see so many of you. As Frank has said, I'm the lead journalist, but I'm only one person. We've got Marshall, so there's two people that are paid. But we have to do four hours of programming a week by December. We're not going to be able to do it just the two of us. There's no way. And in fact, the grant actually requires that we have volunteers, people from the community who are either contributing to the program, helping to develop the programs. Um, so there's two angles to this. There's volunteers who can help us behind the scenes, um, like Jesse's doing with the camera work, and we will provide training. So if you don't have the skills, but you have the interest, we will be doing training to allow you to get the skills to help us do the programming we need. Um, this is the form. I'm just going to show it to you. It's a nice form. Well done, guys. The guys on the board did this. And uh, so the positions needed... Sorry, excuse me. I haven't been in front of a microphone in a while, obviously. <laughs> Popping all over the place. Okay, <clears throat> so the positions needed. Producers, hosts, interviewers, reporters, researchers, camera operators video editors, administrative help, transportation, fundraisers, and more. And the other way we want people in the community to help us is with ideas. We want to know what you want to know about. It's, this programming is all about Gabriola for Gabriolans. We have our ideas about what's important, of course, and we're going to pursue those. But we really want to hear from the community. So this week, I'll be posting on the Facebook Community Bulletin Board page, which is our main 
way we're going to communicate with you and the main way we're going to put out our programming. That's going to be the first, the first place any programming goes out. We'll go out on that page. So on that page this week, we're going to ask you a question about what is important to you. We have identified, because the grant actually uh, told us to do this, or guided us to do this, <coughs> sorry, um, we had to identify five civic issues that are important to people on Gabriola. So what we've come up with, the environment, and of course that includes fire risk, which is very present right now, water, and all kinds of other stuff. Islands Trust declared a climate emergency in 2019. So on Tuesday, I'm going to be interviewing Islands Trust people about that to find out what was the plan, what is the plan, <laughs> and going forward, what will be the plan. Because, you know, with everything happening in Maui, Kelowna, Yellowknife, I mean, we're all worried about it. Um, I noticed on the Facebook page this week, actually, that there's a woman, Shirley Nicholson, who has been doing some emergency planning help on the island. So I'm going to be interviewing her hopefully this week if I can get her. So, you know, we will be following. We aren't set up as a newsroom because we don't have the bodies. But we will be doing current affairs on the news, the important news that that's coming out. So if it's the fire, we will pursue that and we'll find out. You know, I'm going to be talking to the fire chief this week. I'm going to be talking to Islands Trustees, RDN, and all kinds of people on Gabriola about what you think is important in this crisis that we're in right now. The second one we've identified is food security, which is also related to the environment, obviously. Uh, but it's a big issue being on an island. We have to take care of our own food supplies because if the ferry can't come over, we're stuck. So that's a big issue for islands and for this island, for all of the Gulf Islands, actually. Uh, the third civic issue is services or lack of, um, and that covers housing, medical care, and staffing for commercial uh, restaurants and retail outlets and so on. I think we all know that these are issues that are local and global. And that's one thing I want to say. Right now, local is global. It totally is. Right? We're here worried about fire. We're looking at Kelowna, we're looking at Maui, you know. So we're really connected, I think, as a world right now because of the internet. So I really view local as global. So I, I'm jumping all over the place, I know. I, I was a national reporter with CBC for a long time and I covered many issues across the country, indigenous issues. I was a legal reporter in Montreal for a long time. Um, God, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting all the things that I did, but I was a producer, I was a documentarian, and I've won awards for all of my various roles that I played because I work really hard and I care deeply, and that's the thing. Um, as a journalist, if you don't have that heart that's caring for the stories, caring for the people, it doesn't push you as hard to, to pursue the stories, you know? When you've got that drive inside, which unfortunately or fortunately I do, I pursue things. So, the fourth uh, civic topic is truth and reconciliation, which is a national issue of great importance to all Canadians, and particularly in British Columbia. We have many Indigenous nations in this province. Um, so, we are going to be tackling that issue, looking at what we're doing on Gabriola around truth and reconciliation, what's been done, what should we be doing. What do people think about that whole process? So we'll be exploring that as well with the uh, indigenous group in Nanaimo that is based here on, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce it. I'm new, so I'm learning. And I think it's Snunaimuk. Did I say it right? Snunaimuk? Snunaimuk. Snunaimuk. Snunaimuk? I'm going to work on it. I'm going to consult the actual nation to educate me. I'm new, as you know. So. The fifth item, or the fifth civic issue that we're looking at is arts and the economy. And I've been told since I came here, and I'm pretty sure it's a credible source, that the census says that there are more artists on this island earning a living from their art than anywhere else in Canada per capita. Which, that's not true? I gotta, no, that's not true, okay. So we are gonna, pardon?
Okay, well, that's still pretty good. <laughs> but anyway, so I do, that's why I really want to pursue the arts from the point of view, not from a light angle, but from a hard angle of how does it contribute to our healthy community and our healthy economy on Gabriola? And we know that it is, there's so many artists on this island contributing. The other thing I believe is that artists, the way they approach life, can teach us a lot right now in the crisis that we're in in the world. And I want to explore those values with artists to find out what they can share with us. That's the great thing about this grant, is that they really, they don't want fluffy stories about the arts, for instance. They want something solid. So in community television, as I said to you, by December, we have to put out four hours of programming a week, which is a lot of programming. So it'll be different than mainstream media. We're going to go, we're delving deep and we're going to go long. So our interviews could be 20 minutes to a half hour long. You might get bored and tune out. That's okay. But in this complicated, complex world we're living in right now, I think going, delving deeper is actually the answer. Now, the main thing that I want to do as a journalist here is to create, we're creating an opportunity for dialogue amongst the people who live here, the official people and just the regular people. Um, you know, as a journalist, my job is not to change things. My job is to observe and document and then record and put that out there for people to be informed and educated. And then the society can make the decisions. The society comes up with the solutions. And on this island, I have seen incredible community uh, participation in creating solutions. Like yesterday, I was at the market and I just learned about the clinic that was created by the foundation here that was created. I mean, so you guys are already doing it. And we now are here just to capture these stories. And uh, again, we want them to come from you to us. And um, so we'll keep communicating with you on the Facebook page. Uh, we'll be sending out everything out there, and we'll be asking constantly for feedback in. Then we will take whatever you put on Facebook. Like if you come on there and you, you talk about racism and, and the problems around homophobia and such, then we'll take that and we'll make that into uh, some programming. We'll actually be able to take your idea and then either follow it up with our interviews or just put it on like that and then interview you. You know, if you're willing. <laughs> so it really is about the community. Like Frank said, we have to have the volunteers. We already have a whole bunch lined up. And I hope you will volunteer today if you're here for that purpose. We've got a special volunteer here today. Hello. Hello. What's your name? I'm Tatiana. <laughs> Hello. And why did you come today? Well, I wanted to talk about um, the project and I wanted to ask you a few questions after. Can I ask you a few questions? Yes. So what kind of ideas do you have? What kind of ideas do you have for programming on our show? Is there a segment that you have in mind? Well, I have a few ideas, like mm, interviewing francophones on Gabriola because I speak French. Also a segment on local artists and writers, um, like Melinda Wild, or I'm neighbors with someone who just illustrated a kids book or the great author Sasha Colby who just happens to be my mother <laughs> <laughs> and also a youth ideas series because I think kids have a lot of ideas and sometimes not a place to tell them to people what kinds of ideas <laughs> I think ideas on climate change on anything really anything at all okay and are you nervous getting up in front of these people no <laughs> I think we have a natural here. <laughs> All right, Titania. Well, that's awesome. Do you have some questions for me? I do. All right, I'll hold the mic while you ask. Thank you. If you want to hold it. No, you've got to look. Okay, sure. Okay, so clearly this is a very organized project with many professionals, many of whom are retired, probably. Um, so I just want to ask you, why are you doing this project, and what do you see for it? That's a great question. So... The reason why I'm doing this project sorry, is because I have been a journalist for 40 years. I started my career up in Prince Rupert. 
uh, in the Northwest, covered Haida Gwaii, covered the Niska, covered Gitsamwitzowetan, covered the Gustafson Lake standoff, the Lyle Island standoff. I've covered indigenous issues extensively in this province. Um, so I've always been a journalist, or for 40 years I've been a journalist, and I've been watching what's been happening to journalism in the world, as we all have. And I really, really feel like this opportunity is going to fill a gap that is there in the current media landscape. And I would love to be a part of that because, you know, when I first went to Prince Rupert in 1984, um, CBC then had a station in Prince Rupert, a full station. And uh, the kind of journalism I want to do here is the kind of journalism we did there. And because it was more locally oriented at that time as opposed to today. So that's really the, I think I'm a journalist to my core. And even though I'm sort of semi-retired and trying to do other things, here I am. Because I couldn't resist this opportunity and that's the truth. <laughs> Um, another question is, you already mentioned um, training people for skills they need, like on-camera skills or video editing. So who would provide this training? Okay, well, um, I'll be involved in the training, as well as uh, Marshall and some of our board members who are very good at uh, with technical skills around editing and uh, camera and so on. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess that's, that's it. I, you know, my goal as a journalist is to just give, if people come in and want to be journalists and want to work in the journalist side of it, as opposed to the technical side, uh, my goal is to just give you the basics for what you need to, the core, core teachings that you need that journalists practice. That's what I'm going to teach. So it's not going to be like an extensive year-long course at, at a university. <laughs> but it's going to be to the point and it's going to be really useful practical uh, tools for how to cover a story. Because a lot of people, they watch the news, but they really don't know how to, act, to bring one to air. And so that's what I will provide, how to focus your story. That's one of the key things in journalism. At CBC, we had a focus statement. You always have to have a focus statement in order to know what your story is because they're often complex. There's often three or four angles in a story and you have to be able to zone in on that and, and identify. So those are the kinds of skills I'll be training people in as a journalist and then Frank and the others will do the technical training. Thank you. Um, just one more question. So obviously you're interested in young people because I'm here and I'm young. Um, what contributions do you think that young people could make to this project? That's such a great question. That's a great question. Um, I think the, the voice of youth and, and even like younger than youth children, it's very important right now because, um, you know, if you listen to some media outlets, the world is ending. It's very apocalyptic out there at times. There's a lot of depression. There's a lot of despair. There's a lot of hopelessness. There's a lot of like, what can we do? And I think youth and young people have in their hearts just the joy of life naturally and a positive attitude towards life. And so I think you can teach us the older crowd, how to manage our emotions so that we don't become convinced we're at the end of the world. <laughs> I was just talking to a guy at the Gertie bus stop the other day. And, you know, he was a lovely man. And, but it just, our conversation went so quickly into this rabbit hole of the end of the world. <laughs> and I just had to look at him and I said, you know what? Positivity for me right now is a survival tool. So I can't have this conversation with you, sorry. So I think young people like you, with your energy and your new eyes in the world, will really help us to balance out that. So there. And thank you very much for coming. Thank I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. We'll see you. Okay. You're going to be on the show.
he'll be appearing on the show at some point. So I'm saying show. So the idea is, I know I'm jumping around. Excuse me for doing that, but it's a Sunday. What can I say? <laughs> um, we will be, this week we will be putting out like programming on the bulletin board page. There will be interviews. There will be short segments, short little bits. But eventually what our goal is, is to have a current affairs show every week on a Wednesday. We'll put it out there. It'll begin, it'll be about an hour long, and by December, it'll be four hours long. <laughs> so, um, in that current affairs show, what we will do is we will package together all of the interviews that we were doing during the week and putting it out on the Facebook page and on the YouTube channel. So, we have a lot of programming to do, and we need voices from all ages, all backgrounds, the whole community needs to be represented on this channel, otherwise we are failing. So, put the word out to your friends, please. Okay, I, I think I said everything I'm supposed to say. <laughs> Let me just see. Do you want to know anything more about my background as a journalist? Yeah. You do? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I sort of jumped over that, I know. I don't really like to do that. But, yeah, okay, so... Um, in journalism? Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a funny story. I graduated from university with a political science degree and a sociology minor. And um, I didn't know what to do with it. And um, some friends were going to journalism school. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll be a journalist. It was very fickle at the beginning. I actually originally wanted to be a social worker. And that's what I went to school for, but then changed. Anyway, so... Um, so I was in St. John's, Newfoundland. So that's the other thing I should tell you. I am from Newfoundland and Labrador, but I have been living and reporting in BC for many of the last 40 years. Let's say 30 of the last 40 years, give or take, like coming and going. I lived here for periods of time and then I went back to Newfoundland. I'm bi-coastal. That's my condition. It's either BC or it's Newfoundland. Anyway, so I was in Newfoundland. I just finished you know, school and uh, I was looking for a job. And uh, so I took my resume and I went around to all the media outlets in town and everybody said, go back to journalism school and learn this, you know, job before we give you a job. One said, do you have any ideas? CBC Radio. CBC Radio was my home for 20 something years as a daily news reporter. Uh, but anyway, so that's how I got into it. So I went in and I talked to the executive producer there uh, in St. John's and he said, do you have any ideas? And I said, well, I said, the George Street is being turned into a pedestrian street for, and it's just all going to be pubs, and there'll be no cars on it, and people will be able to just walk and drink and party and have a good time on that street. And uh, so there was a city council meeting that night. They said, go to the meeting. And I said, okay, so off I go to the meeting. I knew nothing about journalism at this point. I just want you to know. Uh, before I left the office, they gave me a, a piece of a, a, a tape recorder, a Sony, and they taught me how to watch the VU meter for when people were talking, and then I could know when they were distorting their voices or if it was a good level. That's how much training I had on my first story. But anyway, so I went to the, to the city council, did all my interviews, came back to the station. It's nighttime. Nobody was there. There was no producer there to help me. But there was a writer broadcaster who was finishing her story for the next morning. So she's like, who are you? And I'm like, well, I'm Teresa O'Leary. You know, I have this tape from this meeting. I'm supposed to do a story on it. And she just looks at me like, oh, God, right? She's got to show me how to do it now. So she says, uh, okay, well, first thing, you have to get your tape dubbed. What's dubbing? <laughs> That's how little I knew. <laughs> anyway, so went through the process. She told me to pick out some clips from my interviews and write around it and write an intro, and I did it. Then she took me down to the studio, I voiced it, and boom, boom, it went to air the next morning. <laughs> I was shocked. No one was more shocked than I when that happened, I tell you. So that was the beginning, and I loved it. And I think the thing with me, sometimes you have a natural ability that you don't know about. My voice is deep, as you know, and it was a good radio voice. And back in the day, radio, CBC Radio valued the voice, and they would hire people with a low timber like I have. And so that actually just opened up the world of radio to me, actually, my own voice, which I didn't even know, you know, till that 
experience. So anyway, and then I did a little bit of freelancing, learning a little bit there in Newfoundland for a year, and then I applied for the job in Prince Rupert and uh, got the full-time job as a CBC reporter at the age of 21 years old. Flew across the country, and, you know, we didn't have internet back then. Long-distance calls were expensive. <laughs> but it was an adventure, and uh, I don't regret it. And when I went to Rupert, like I said, there was a CBC station there, and there were major issues going on that we were covering, like Haida Gwaii. Uh, I was there on the island of Lyle Island in 1985, which was a pivotal moment in this province's history around land claims. And uh, I was on the island for three weeks reporting for National Radio News. And uh, I won a Gabriel Award for that work. Now, to me, I won the award not because I did anything special. I'm the messenger. That's all I am. I'm the storyteller. I'm the messenger. Um, the reason why I won that award was because um, it was an incredibly important story. And I happened to be the one telling it. And how lucky for me. But anyway, so that set my career off. And then I went to Montreal. I was a legal reporter there for four years. A palais de justice. Je parle français. <laughs> and I became bilingual there and reported on um, the Fabricant trial. Some of you guys might remember that. It was the worst mass murder in Canada at the time. And um, I did a bit of Oka. There's a riot in Oka I went to. Covered a lot of hostage takings in Montreal. Let's put it this way. I'm 40 years veteran in this business, and I know the business. And although the technologies have changed, nothing else, nothing has changed. Journalism is still the same as it's always been. It's about who, what, where, when, and why, right? Those five whys. Uh, did I say five? What, when, where, who, and why? Uh, sorry, I missed one. <laughs> anyway, so any questions, and then I'll finish up. No? Okay. Well, thanks again for coming. Really look forward to hearing from you guys, either as volunteers or as community citizens. If you have any suggestions about segments that you'd like to see, we're developing segments with community partners. So we'll be hopefully doing a health segment, we'll be doing a youth segment, um, you know, so we're just looking for ideas as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa O'Leary. As I say, we're very lucky to have her here on the island. Very freshly, but here. So we want to wrap up. I know the smoke is a problem for some people. Uh, I'd like to, before uh, we do, address uh, the question about uh, the platforms we'll be using uh, and then answer any other quick questions you might have. Uh, we will all be here lingering afterwards to further answer questions. So we, uh, we want to distribute uh, programming on the Life on Gabriel Community Bulletin Board because it is the largest on the island with 7,500 no, 7,800 plus uh, members. Um, not that all of them are active, but that's uh, potentially a very large audience uh, of Gabrielans and people off island too. So the idea is rather than making people come to us, we'll go to where they are. This is something I've seen work very, very well in the performing arts, and uh, I'm actually interested in the idea of applying it to journalism. Um, we have made a proposal to uh, take over supervision of that board. Uh, because we want to make sure it is a good context for the journalism we're doing. Uh, as part of that, if uh, we do so, we would um, in, uh, undertake a review of the uh, modding policies of it to make sure, again, that it's an appropriate uh, place for our programming and for the community to have discussion about our programming, good and bad. Uh, so that is a proposal we have made, and um, Ken is currently undertaking a process of public comments. So I encourage you to provide your comments on the notion that we might assume supervision of that board. But as I've said, the programming will appear uh, on other Facebook uh, boards as well, on YouTube, and on the National Community Media Portal. And frankly, anybody can share it anywhere they want. Does that address your question? I don't know if the person's here anymore. I hope that addresses that question. Are there other questions? Other questions I can answer? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. So uh, some of you may know that uh, Meta uh, has decided to suppress the distribution of Canadian news content. Uh, we could discuss that. I won't right now. 
I will just say that having help, uh, along with Google, helped to, con to kill the news media, including in Canada, yeah, they might take a different approach. But at any rate, yes, they are currently suppressing the distribution of Canadian news to Canadians. Uh, we are in a slightly fortunate position, I hope, and this is another reason we uh, want to use the Life on Gabriel Community Bulletin Board. It is not identified as a news media platform. So my feeling is we can fly under the radar until this thing gets sorted out. So um, I, I'm hopeful that for that reason, and we are also proposing to take over the old uh, Gabriella Co-op radio uh, page uh, and renaming it as the you know, Life on Gabriella TV page, I guess. But it, it is also not identified as a news media site. So uh, what we're our, our plan right now is to fool Facebook's algorithms. And if that doesn't work, we'll, we'll find, figure out something else. Meantime, if you have any thoughts personally uh, about the uh, uh, approach of Meta to Canadian news for Canadians, I suggest you take it up with them. Any other questions I can answer quickly? I, I'm also glad to talk to you at the table. Yes. Well, we will, um, so among other things, we're going to create a pop-up TV studio. We thought we have some equipment now. We will soon have a switcher, which will allow us to create a TV studio, basically, in various situations. Uh, we, so we anticipate that at times we'll be, I don't know, hopefully maybe at the GAC Hall. At other times, you know, who knows where, the Aggie Hall, wherever, uh, recording. But uh, we, are, we will not have a fixed physical TV station, no. And a lot of it will be coming from on location, like this. Uh, a lot of it will be people in their homes or their places of business. And I think Teresa is planning to do what are called streeters this coming week. So uh, watch for her at Folklife Village asking people questions. We are released from all that. So I'm going to quickly tell you a little story. I remember that uh, the other night I realized, what did I want to be when I grew up? And at first I wanted to be a TV cameraman. And then I remembered, oh yeah, I wanted to run a TV station. Seriously, when I was about 10. I go, what, do I, what do I want to be when I grow up? I want to run a TV station. So watch what you wish for, especially at age 10. But this is a TV station. It's just a TV station of a new kind. All right, I'm going to uh, call this to a close, but we will all be here to talk with you further. Now, I would like to point out that over there are forms to sign up as volunteers individually, and that's mostly what we hope you will do today. Uh, look and see what we need, propose other things you can do to help out. Um, there is also over there uh, a sponsorship form, which is intended more for businesses and organizations. So please make sure you get the right form. But if you happen to be a representative or involved with a business or organization, we really need you as a sponsor. And yes, we will work deals. So there are two different forms over there, one for individual volunteers, one for uh, sponsorships by businesses and organizations. Yes, Ben. What a good question, Ben. <laughs> Donate money. So yes, as I said, the funding goes to our journalists. It covers their fees. That's the fundament of this. Uh, and some of it, not much, goes to equipment. So we have acquired some equipment. We will acquire more. We do need to raise money. Now, we have just launched a GoFundMe. Because what else do you do? Uh, and you will be hearing more about that over the next week. But you can go find it now on GoFundMe, Life on Gabriola TV. And if you are so inclined, please donate. Uh, and we will also have a Patreon campaign eventually. But today, you can go put money in that donation jar over there. It says donations right on it. And we would certainly welcome your donations. And we will be continuing. If you cannot donate time to this, or that's not your inclination, we certainly hope you might support us financially. How long will this last? Well, yes, the funding will probably roll over in March, but that's not a guarantee that we will actually be properly positioned to continue. So we will have to find additional funding. If you can help us out starting now, 
Please do. All right, I'm going to uh, ask Ben to maybe uh, uh, play some background music again as we mingle. Please stay to chat. Please stay to chat with, oh no, I know what I need to do. I would like all the members of our board who happen to be able to be here this afternoon to please come up and join me. Jesse, who else? Chris, uh, Nathan, Ray, Gary, whoever I've forgotten. Oh no, I'm not supposed to do that, Ben. Um, not uh, all our members were be able to be here today, but these people, Jesse Zhang, who actually is from Seisuchen, uh, Nathan Tinkham, the great Nathan Tinkham, the great Chris Bowers, the great Gary Holmes, the great Ben Sams, and the great Ray Appel are all members of our board, and they have been doing a huge amount of work in the last two weeks to throw this thing on its feet really fast. Uh, oh, who are we missing today? No, is this everybody? Could this possibly be everybody? Wow. I think this is maybe all. Yes, I think this is all of us. Isn't that surprising? <laughs> and you. We we look forward to bringing. Uh, look, we look forward to bringing for, uh, more people onto our board, and we look forward to diversifying it. Uh, we need indigenous representation on this board. We need uh, uh, more women on this board. And we need more non-binary representation on this board. So we will be looking forward to making this a more diverse board as we go forward. Uh, yes, and ben, uh, ben is actually uh, talking to us already about having EDIA policies around inclusiveness and diversity. I can tell you that from working in theater, those are very important values in theater. Not so much in journalism yet. And we have talked about making sure we uh, work to change that. All right? And so, if I may, I'm going to call the formal part of this to a close. Thank these board members again. Thank all of you for coming out. We hope you will volunteer. Uh, and uh, we will be here to talk with you more about that for a bit yet. Uh, here she is. Oh, yeah. So uh, the programming mandate is Gabriola centric, Gabriola first. And most of our beginning programming is going to be a about Gabriolans, made by Gabriolans. Uh, but we will uh, also expand out, our mandate is also to the adjoining islands. I'm not going to try to name them because I'll leave one out. The adjoining islands and eventually the entire Salish Sea region. So uh, we are beginning focused here, we're finding our center of balance here, uh, and we will move outwards from here. All right? Thank you for being here. Come talk to us. Gabriel, Life on Gabriela TV. You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. Thanks for watching Island View, and see you again next week. Have a great Labor Day weekend, and be safe.